Okay, so uh, hello and welcome to the April SRS meeting. Uh, Steve is still out, uh, you know, and has some conflicts and Chaz actually had a conflict today. So I'm gonna host today and I'm also the presenter. So uh, you guys get to hear probably far more of me than you want to, but we'll go with that. We, um, we are recording, so uh, hope everybody's aware of that and doesn't, uh, doesn't have any objections. Let's see, let me get the slides going. Got that. Okay, can folks see that okay? And pop off mute if you, everybody should be on mute at the moment, so. Okay, somebody's somebody's whistling. Let me go find that and let's see. Sorry, that was me. I got it. Oh, no worries. <laughs> okay, the old open mic thing. So uh, welcome to the April 2024 meeting of Seattle Robotics Society. Our video is provided by Zoom. So just to let you know, we are recording all these meetings and we will post them to uh, YouTube later. Um, Below, we've kind of got a uh, outline of the of the agenda for today. Uh, the first hour, as we normally do, is going to be kind of just chatting around the room, talking about club business and so forth. And then uh, we'll take a break for about 10 minutes. And then we'll start the presentation. Let's see. Uh, please mute your microphone unless you're actively sharing. You can use the Zoom chat to ask questions, make comments, and so forth. Uh, along with the video, the, Ju the Zoom chat will be posted. <laughs> okay, uh, it's club business, uh, Lloyd, that's me for folks who don't know me yet, um, or Chaz, uh, will be running the meetings for a little bit. Steve K is still doing um, presenter scheduling and updating the website. Uh, let's see. So does anybody have any past events? Uh, March 16th was uh, war. Uh, Western Allied Robotics ran uh, their uh, event up on March 16th. Um, does anybody have any past events they want to share, talk about? Go ahead and just pop off the um, pop off mute and then just you know chime in. Okay, we'll move on. Uh, there's a few local maker spaces around. There's Snowco Makers up in Everett. There's a K the King County Library System and Federal Way both have maker spaces. There's Crea Maker Space in Renton, Seattle Maker Space, um, Airlight Time Space is in Seattle. There's North End Maker Space. There's Creation Station in Tacoma. Um, I did come across one other one in the Bellingham Mall. I was up there the other uh, couple weekends ago, and there's a very nice maker space up there. Uh, so if anybody has any other maker spaces they want to share, uh, just let Steve know, and um, his email's in the, in here shortly. Actually, his email. Yep, just uh, email Seattle Robotics Society at gmail.com. Okay, upcoming events. Uh, the War Hobby Expo was April 13th and 14th. That's uh, already passed. Uh, if you want to catch the last day of Robo Games, I believe that's in California. That's got today and tomorrow left. The Robot Combat League National Championship is May 10th through the 12th. Um, there's a robot event sites for national events and meetings at the Snowco Makerspace. We're going to do a mini Robothon on June 8th. Um, this will be, so I'm helping coordinate that as well. The mini Robothon is, uh, let me talk about it when we get down there. We got a specific slide just for it. If you have any other uh, physical or virtual Robothon events, um, let Steve know at Seattle, Robot Seattle Robotics Society at gmail.com. Okay, now we'll talk about the Robothon event. So we're gonna do a mini Robothon on June 8th. 
the this will be our well our second in person event uh, since COVID. So we've kind of moved away from doing in person meetings. Obviously, we're all high or we're all remote now. Uh, but we are what we are doing is trying to schedule about two in person um, events throughout the year. This is the first one. It'll be June eighth at the new First Wa Field House. This is in Kent. Um, we're going to be doing, well, you can get full details at robothon.org. And we're going to be doing the build challenges, uh, one, two, and three. So that's going around, you know, having a, a set of robots, you know, so it's open robot competition is free to attend. Basically, um, build challenge one is you go around a set of cones. They're in a square and uh, they're 15, it's a 15 foot square. So you just go around the outside of the cones. It's a simple navigation. Build challenge two is you'll drive out 50 feet and then turn around and come back. Build challenge three is driving out 50 feet and coming back to your original starting point with um, an obstacle in the way or more one or more obstacles in the way. We will be doing the pop can challenge and we're also gonna be doing mini sumo. So uh, for full details on that, go to robothon.org. Um, I'm getting the website updated on that. We'll have a schedule. It looks like we're going to run from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And it'll be an in-person event. And, you know, they're generally a lot of fun. Okay. Um, if you want to help out running these events, also feel free to uh, uh, sign up. And we can always use more people to help run these. Okay, Steve is continuing to look for presenters. I think he's yeah, he's got the next couple of months booked up for, for sure. We'll see a schedule in a minute. But if you've got uh, anybody you know that would like to do a presentation or you would like to do a presentation, please reach out to Steve at uh, Seattle, Robo Seattle Robotic Society at gmail.com. Um, don't try to schedule them. Let Steve do the scheduling. But um, it's basically a one hour or shorter presentation. And um, yeah, pretty much you know, any robotics related topic is, is good to go. Uh, we, if we don't happen to have a presenter, we'll do an open discussion. So we've done this several of these in the past and they're pretty fun. Uh, we're looking for moderators for this as well. And this is just a list of topics that um, you know, people have put forth that you know, sound interesting. Um, if you want to do an open discussion on a topic we don't have listed, just let Steve know, and that's perfectly okay, too. All right, so for 2024, and it looks like he's getting into 2025, um, here's what we've got for a schedule. Uh, April is me. I'll be talking about CUDA programming today, and it looks like... Our next open slot is August. Um, I'll have to check with Steve. I think September may be uh, on site. I, I don't remember. Last time he did this, there was a tour. So we'll have to see if that's uh, a tour or not. But anyway, August, November, December, August, October, and November are open slots in the, in the near term if anyone would like to do a presentation. Okay, coming up today, uh, I'll be talking about doing CUDA without a PhD. Just for quick reference, if you don't know what CUDA is, that's how to program the GPU. So instead of, you know, like four or eight processors, uh, for certain situations, you can get access to thousands of processors and get speed up from that. Uh, let's see, after the meeting, I'm going to have to disappear right about 12 o'clock uh, Pacific time today. But if folks want to hang around and continue to chat, that's perfectly um, acceptable and encouraged. We will stop the video for that. Um, you're right about 12 o'clock. We'll check and see if anybody wants to do that. And what I'll do is I'll hand the host position or the control of the meeting over to somebody so you, know, you can end the meeting when uh, everybody's done. But you're perfectly welcome to hang around and chat for as long as you want. Okay, so around the room, does anybody have something they would like to share? Let's go back to this one. Um, so I'll stop sharing uh, generally for folks that are new. It's anybody who wants to share, just dip like James has done, raise your hand and we'll 
pass it off to you. So James, what do you got? I guess I should unmute now. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I can whistle for you. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to, to share something kind of dumb, but I think it's educational. Um, and I hope that people will find it of use in, uh, in helping to um, teach kids about robotics. Uh, one of the problems that we have in like teaching kids is that it's hard to get uh, kids out of their cell phones or out of their laptops or whatever, out of their houses actually. Um, and it's, uh, we're moving more and more into a world where simulation is the, is the key and uh, actually doing things in the real world doesn't happen. And I'm, I'm sad about that. I do think it's really important to do things in the real world, but I also think that you can kind of maybe get kids hooked on the idea of robotics um, by starting off in simulation and then, you know, moving into something else. So um, Tinkercad is absolutely, you know, fantastic in my, in my humble opinion. Um, and I just wanted to share a few of the things that I've been doing in it. This one is just real simple. The idea behind this is that you can, you know, have some kind of a shape. This isn't fully realized. It's just the start of an idea. Um, but the, but the point here is that you can use the weight of a robot to, um, I can show this accurately here, but see how there's a little slot right there. And the, the shaft is connected to the wheels but it's not connected to the body except by that slot. And so the weight of the brains of the robot and the battery and the, and the little support back here that holds the cell phone and the motor are all pressing down and that causes this motor shaft to be more thoroughly pressed against the top of the motor. So that, that's nothing real big there. But uh, the other thing that Tinkercad has that a lot of people don't realize is it has a really good circuit simulator in it. It's not, you know, necessarily going to be completely accurate, but it's simple enough to use and it's got enough features in it that you can actually make little things that kind of come to life. And this is a, a little simple circuit to drive a motor off of a, a light sensor. So you can get one of these really cheap little light sensors. And um, what we're doing is in the simulation here, this little slider is just controlling the amount of light that it quote unquote sees um, in the simulation. And you can see that as I change the amount of light, it actually will um, make the motor run or not run. And I have a ammeter built in there so that you can see that um, obviously, it would be entirely possible to do something with a Arduino. Um, and what's really cool about this is that not only can you add an Arduino into your little simulated circuit, but you can actually program it. And you can program it with Blockly or you can program it with text. And in this case, all yes. I'm doing is reading. The, sorry. Uh, I'm just reading the log sensor here and then I'm constraining the speed and writing that back out to the to the motor. So it's a super, super simple little simulation. And if I start it again, you can see that as I change the amount of light, the motor starts to move or or doesn't move. The advantage of this, of course, is that this could be instead of a DC motor driver, it could be a servo, you could be doing, you know, whatever um, you wanted to with the Arduino. And then the other day, uh, actually, before that, I did an a H bridge uh, with light blocks. I won't bother showing that. But the idea here is that there's a two controls. One of them is speed, and the other one is direction. And they're just wired into the little H bridge driver so that you can make the motor go in two different directions instead of just one direction, which is handy. And then this is the one I really wanted to show you. Um, I'll actually go ahead and open it up because I think this is worth seeing. Uh, this is actually a combination of a DC motor with an encoder, and they, they have another one, a different one, but this is actually based on a real part that you could buy off of, you know, AliExpress or wherever. And of course, there's the, you know, famous little h bridge driver. It's all connected up to the Arduino. Uh, the encoder's connected to the Arduino as well. And there's code 
that you can take a look at here. Um, I tried a fun little experiment and I actually tried to get Gemini, uh, which is uh, Google's new version of uh, artificial intelligence to write the code for it. You can go to this link if you want to and see the uh, the actual code that it wrote. Uh, what's cool about it is it, it, it wrote code that looks good and it gives an absolutely brilliant explanation of how it works and the code is completely wrong. Um, it never looks at the prior state of the encoder so it can't possibly work. So I instead uh, used the old uh, matrix uh, setup which you can read all about how to do that from the Spark Fun link. Basically, it's looking at the prior and new state uh, <coughs> excuse me, of the encoders um, in order to read them. There's a little thing called read encoder here that is set up as an interrupt and you use pins that can be interrupted in order to get maximum speed out of it. Uh, and then in the loop, we just read the, we check the position and if it's changed, we compute a new uh, drive by taking the goal minus the position and use that to drive the motor. And of course it works perfectly because it's a simulation. <laughs> uh, so in the real world, this probably, you know, I think you guys probably know it wouldn't work, uh, at least not well. It would oscillate or undershoot. And so, um, you know, this is where you start getting into like PID control. But the idea here is to just, you know, get something started that's maybe uh, clear enough that people can actually understand it. Um, and then there's um, a little motor drive thing here that constrains the drive signal and then runs the H bridge, um, always setting low first to avoid burning it out, which I guess most of these days are protected. And then it also gets into some stuff about how serial works and how you can only do a serial update every so often, you know, kind of teaching a little bit about the real world effects of it. What's interesting is that the simulation, because it's perfect, um, actually won't work <laughs> because uh, if you turn the motor off, uh, there's no vibration. There's nothing that makes the encoder tick uh, before the before the motor moves. So in the simulator, I actually have to tell it to drive the motor when the code starts in order to get um, any kind of a signal to come back from the encoder in order for it to actually uh, start working. Because otherwise, this this code right here never actually runs. So I thought that was kind of interesting. It kind of points out the difference between simulation and not simulation. Anyway, there's a serial monitor in here, virtual, and you can fire that up. There's also you know, your graph, and if you start the simulation, there is, by the way, a debugger, so you can click on any of these points and it'll stop at that point. You can see it. But as you can see um, down here at the bottom, I just developed a fake goal, uh, which is this blue line that's being plotted right here, and that's the first number in the column that gets printed out. The second number is the actual position of the uh, motor, which is this orange line, which you can see is trying to follow the goal position. And it does it okay when the goal is changing slowly, but then when the goal position changes rapidly, you get this divergence where it can't keep up and it kind of has to overshoot and then turn around. It doesn't simulate physics all that well, but it tries. And then this red line here is the uh, drive signal that's being generated. That's the third number here. You can see how it maxes out at minus 255 um uh, where it's relatively low when it's going forward and then it suddenly will max out at minus 255. you may be able to see there's a very faint blue line right there which is this last number i plotted that because their graph doesn't show you where the zero is on the axis so i was trying to show that the drive only goes a little bit positive and then suddenly goes very very negative in order to try to keep the motor within position and you can see the motor shaft over here turning back and forth and you can Again, you can break point it at any point and see you know, exactly what it is that's going on. So it'll stop there and then you can mouse over and you can see what the numbers are. There's the goal, there's the position, there's the drive and you can single step um, and it'll go in and show you, you know, exactly what it's doing with the code. And then you can start it running again and it'll go around to the next breakpoint. So anyway, uh, I thought that was pretty cool and uh, I shared it with a bunch of places, and Tinkercad seemed to like it, and I'm going to be using it in the class that I'm going to be teaching uh, this summer for UCSD Extension for high school kids. So that's my share. Yeah, that's really cool. I got a couple questions for you, James. Uh huh. How extensive is the component library for this thing? So, you know, I see a few standard things in there like Uno and the standard motor drive. It, how? Yeah. How robust is the, the stuff you can simulate? 
I uh, I stopped sharing too soon. Let me uh, let me show you that real quick. Let's see if I turn code off. Here's the component. So it's just showing you the basic components uh, to start with, and the big ones here are the the micro bit and the Arduino Uno, um, and then you know okay. just the generic stuff you're gonna need. And then you can go to all, and you can see the list gets a little bit larger. There's some general. Uh, components there's some input stuff push buttons pot slide switches photoresistors okay. photodiodes uh, more active light sensors there's flex sensors force sensors ultrasonics pir moisture tilt temperature gas keypad switches all that kind of stuff of course you have the standard led uh, also rgb you have the neopixels you have the uh, bunch of different neopixels um, Blink and lights are well supported. There's a little vibe motor, a DC motor, a DC motor with encoder, two of those. There's a servo, a couple of different servos. There's the little hobby gear motors that are everywhere. Absolute pieces of garbage, but they're cheap, so people buy them. Uh, and then there's a PZO, IR remote, seven segment, LCD. Seven segment, right, guys? That's the one. <laughs> uh, and then a bunch of different power options. <laughs> Lemon uh, battery, I like it. Potato battery. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know what I love about these coin cells? Um, in simulation, they never run out. That's just wonderful. And they also, they also in simulation, I've noticed the output voltage doesn't drop when you load them. I, I was just going to ask that. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> in reality, of course, uh, that is not the case. And then you get breadboards, different sizes. Uh, you get different... Uh, microcontrollers, including an AT Tiny, which I thought was an interesting uh, addition. Oh, yeah. They don't have a Pi Pico in there yet, which I really wish they did. Uh, that's a whole nother topic of conversation. I've been getting into that and how easy they are to program. Man, they are cool. Um, and then instruments like power supply, multimeter, oscilloscope, function generator. So you got you know a nice selection of those integrated circuits, your standard uh, op amps and timers and Optocouplers, you get your five five five. I mean, you know, could could you even take it seriously if it didn't have a five five five? And then a bunch of different uh, transistors, including uh, some uh, you know uh, MOSFETs, uh, uh, TIP one twenty, and you get your relays, um, single and double throw, five volt regulator, three volt regulator, um, and then a, a simple motor driver. That's the like a stepper motor driver. Well, I think that's. Actually, I think that might be a DC motor driver. I don't know what that is. Um, ground, out, out, in. So that's got to be a DC motor driver. Mm -hmm. And I got to remember how to delete things. There we go. Uh, and then you got an H bridge driver. Uh, you got some connectors. I'm not sure what those are even for, really. Look at this. You got all the basic gates. gates. Okay. All the logic gates that you could, I mean, you can build a whole on computer there. Seven segment decoder, a decade counters, uh, and there's a eight port IC expander there. So goodness gracious, I think pretty much the sky's the limit. Yeah. Any that's other cool. questions about this? Yeah. Um, no, that's cool. Thanks. Does anyone else have any yeah. other questions on this? One, one thing in case I wasn't clear about it is that when you first start this up, it's going to come up in blocks mode. So it'll be blockly. And like my absolute favorite educational feature, which I'm not going to show you right now because it would destroy my code, but you can do blocks plus text in which you, the student can edit the blocks, but it shows them the C++ code that those blocks would produce. Nice. Right? How fantastic is that? Sorry, any other questions? No, that's cool. Thanks for sharing that, James. I had one other observation off of this too. And this, if somebody's looking for a presentation or another topic to host, um, I'm not going to have time to do it in the short term, so I'm going to throw it out for anybody who else would anybody else who would want to. The um, the code that you generated from uh, generative AI. You know, you, you made an interesting comment there. It's all, it looks good. It was explained well, and it worked completely wrong, right? It was, it was, <laughs> yeah. so folks that, you know, attend regularly, would, you'll remember we did one of these, um, you know, we're talking about chat GPT, it was probably about a year or so ago, but a, an interesting talk topic 
would be just how good, you know, is the uh, code generation in these things. I've, from my side, I'm in the consulting space. Um, I've heard stuff kind of all over the board. So some marketing side kind of really pushes it, but people I know that have really tried to use it have run into the same type of thing you did, James. That, that would make for an interesting talk um, for a couple of reasons. One, it's, you know, AI and that's all over the place right now. But the second is, I, you know, from being in the consulting space, I'm seeing companies actually making higher fire decisions based on the hype. Um, not based on the reality, based on the hype. And so it is having a real world impact. Um, it'd be interesting to, you know, do do a little exploration of, hey, what is what really is this here? You know, what what's the benefits? What's the downsides? I, I don't think I could give a full presentation on that. I would love to see one because I do think it's really interesting. But it, if, if I can comment just really quick on that, the big thing that everybody is missing with this stuff, pardon me while a cat climbs up on my back, good Lord, um, is that at, as ever, things work better when the machines and the humans work together. Like the human by themselves isn't all that good. The machine by itself isn't all that good, but when the two of them work together, it's fantastic. So maybe I should have said this before and I, and I didn't really make this comment, but I took that code that Jim and I wrote for me and I took the bulk of the code and just fixed what was wrong, right? Yeah. So I didn't have to type in all the you know rest of it. It got me to a very quick starting point where I could look at it and go, oh, that's not right and then just go in and fix the parts that were wrong. So I got the whole thing done in less time because I used AI, despite the fact that the AI was completely wrong. And I think that's the case all over the place. So yeah. I'm not sure management is wrong in going after that. Uh, I think it could be, I think they could go after it wrongly, <laughs> which knowing managers, they probably are. Uh, yep. <laughs> but my point is just that, you know, knowing how to use AI these days is critical and it's not going away and it's going to be, uh, it's going to help product pr productivity. The figures that I'm hearing from people who are skeptical of AI, okay, are that it actually increases your productivity by at least double and probably by up to 10 times. Yeah. So that's not bad. Yeah, that, that's been my general practical experience with it as well. I'll use it if there's something I don't know off the top of my head and it's not just a, hey, simple, you know, look up this thing. You know, a lot of times I'll have it just, you know, hey, show me an example of how to do X, right? And it gives me a little snippet of code that would have taken me, you know, 10 minutes to a half an hour to go hunt around from several different sources and give me a little snippet of code in like, you know, 10 to 30 seconds. It's like, okay, here's what I need. And I grab it and go. Um, I, I pretty much what, what, what you've shown though, every time I try to have it do anything more complicated, um, it kind of falls over and I have to go chase it down. It's like me, uh, the one, the one I really love, um, especially since you'll see some of my PowerPoint slides, there was one that helped you, you know, put, put a slide deck together. And, uh, I, I tried that generative AI. And it was, I, I found that basically useless. By the time I gave the AI enough information to generate the slide that I needed, I could have just typed it into the slide and been done. So it's, you know, it's just a little bit of an interesting mixed bag. <laughs> okay. Um, does anyone have anything else they wanna, anybody else would like to share? I've got a couple of videos or at least one video we can dive into real quick if uh, we don't have anything. But uh, this is kind of your folks' time to, you know, showcase and, you know, show off what you've been doing. Okay, looks like we got no takers. So um, the, big, the big news thing, at least, that came across my desk this week that was uh, AI-focused was Boston Dynamics has... Um, they basically um, debuted a new um, fully electric, they're calling it Atlas, a uh, humanoid robot. So the videos of this thing are kind of interesting. I'm gonna go ahead and share this.
And we can just watch a video real quickly. Uh, hang on a sec while I figure out how to do this on my Mac. Okay, can folks see that okay? Okay. A huge step forward for robots, and it means we're getting closer to you having your own robot butler. Boston Dynamics is a robotics company that you might know from its cute dog robot that people seem to really enjoy kicking. The big news from the company this week is that it is retiring its humanoid hydraulic robot called the HD Atlas. And frankly, given how much we've seen of the Atlas over the years, I'm going to miss it. But don't worry, the Hyundai-owned company has a new Atlas out, and this one is electric. Now, we're playing the video of it in action right now, but sadly, we just don't have that many details on it, apart from what we can, of course, see in the video. TechCrunch did speak to the company about the new Atlas, but details are just a little mum, given that the company is just starting to show it off. We do know, however, that the new Atlas will work first in Hyundai facilities and not your house. But with a slimmer form factor, grippy hands, and a crazy range of motion, it does look like we're getting to the point when humanoid robots are going to leave the lab and stop working in ones and twos. So get ready for human robot fleets. The new Atlas is hardly the only contender in the market. Tesla has the Optimus line of humanoid robots in the works. Then there's Agility Robotics, which has raised north of $100 million for its own bipedal robot. And then there's Figure, also in the mix, a buzzy startup that just raised $675 million from companies like Amazon, NVIDIA, Microsoft, and OpenAI. Yeah, OpenAI. Which brings us to the other half of making a humanoid robot actually useful, and that's software. Making a robot that can do a single thing well and quickly is something that we humans are actually very, very good at. Go watch any video of a car being welded together, and you'll understand what I mean. But if you want a robot that can learn and do, you are going to need a lot of smart software to make it more than a glorified repetitive motion machine. The good news there is that large language models, or LLMs, the brains behind the latest AI models that everyone can't stop talking about, actually have some pretty cool robotics applications. This should make sense. After all, LLMs can ingest language, ask questions, and then write code. That sounds like a recipe for robots learning on the job. All of this is freaking cool, and it's great to see startups in the mix as well. But it does make me wonder, are we going to get in-home robotic help before we get self-driving cars? Because if we are, that's wild. See you tomorrow. Okay. So anyway, I came across that and thought I would just put that out there. Um, we, can, we got a little bit of time, so if folks want to chat about that, or do folks want to take a break, and we can start the um, formal presentation a little bit early. What would folks like to do? You guys think they made that uh, stand-up sequence that creepy on purpose? I actually think they did. <laughs> <laughs> and, and specifically, so I was talking to, uh, I'm over at my brother-in-law's place uh, this weekend. I was talking to him about this this morning, and I, I don't think they intended to make it creepy. I think they intended to show off the um, the 360-degree articulation mm -hmm. in that robot. That is a massive advantage. And I, I didn't catch yeah. until this particular video that they're going to use this in the... Uh, Hyundai auto plants, that was new to me. Um, that is a massive advantage for a you know for a, a worker or a robot worker in a factory, right? That it's something that humans just can't do. That right. um the torso pivot, you know, is yeah. a totally totally free spinning. It can just sit there and spin around 360 from what I'm hearing, you know, as yeah. much as it wants. Everything's slip rings and uh, you know. Totally, uh, you know, mechanical couplings that don't bind, right? So that that's a huge advantage.
So I, I think has they did that actually, in Charlie. <laughs> sorry, Lloyd. Has anybody actually worked with slip rings, though? I mean, they're, uh, they're a nightmare. A little uh, bit. In most cases. Yeah, a little bit. I'd be curious. Yeah, so I read they've got slip rings in there. I'd be curious to know what they're really doing. My guess is they're transferring power over the slip rings. Other systems I've seen like that, though, use um, basic, I've seen simple systems, and I'm sure they've got something more ro robust, the transfer of the data over uh, optics. You know, so you blink an LED, basically, and use that for your data link, and then you don't have any connection there. Terry, you got your hand up? Um, yeah, I was just wondering what their um, what batteries are using the energy density for those because it seems like it's still pretty a solid. You know, uh, it's much lighter and smaller than the original Atlas, but it still looks pretty dense. And I I think that's you know it'd be interesting to know how long the robot can function um, on battery power. Yeah, I haven't seen anything on that yet. Uh, given given the motors are more efficient than the hydraulics and stuff, I'm going to guess longer. But yeah. I haven't seen anything like like he said. This just came out this week, so yeah, um, I but, think we're going to be seeing a lot more on it in the next couple of weeks. Of course, it'd be an in interesting to know if they do wireless charging on it. Then you could have it standing on a charging pad, you know, in, in a static position or environment where it can easily return to its charging base. Um, while still performing work. That would be amazing. Yeah. The, the part I'm really interested in, um, and again, I mentioned I didn't know this until just, you know, literally this morning, is, you know, they're putting this thing, you know, into service in the Hyundai factories. Um, wow. You know, that that tells me, hey, they got a partnership with Hyundai. They're going to be generating some revenue. They've got a, you know, they've at least got a concept for a practical application for this thing. You know, what's which is, you know, far, far more than, you know, even Tesla, uh, Tesla's robot, you know, it's like Musk has been saying, hey, we're going to put this in our factory. We're going to make, you know, Tesla's with cars and stuff with it. It's like, OK, but it, they're not they haven't claimed they're doing it yet. That's the statement yeah. in that video sounded like they got a plan. They're they're ready to deploy, yeah. you know, um, <clears throat> so th that that's a that's a fairly significant milestone. Yeah, it's quite a, I mean, when you look at the two together, it's quite an advancement off of Atlas One. It's it's amazingly better. Yeah. Yeah. And the, you know, the whole motor capability, and it's it's something I've seen with the uh uh with the Tesla robot, you know, they they've talked about, you know, hey, we had to go out and build, you know, special motors for this thing because you know, motors mm -hmm. that did what we want to do didn't exist and it looks like these guys have used a, a similar motor architecture you know you don't see you can't really tell but it looks like the motors are direct drive or close to direct drive you know they're mm -hmm. the very compact coupled in the joint type of uh um packaging right and don't know what's really going on behind the scenes but it looks very similar to what tes tesla was doing with theirs uh, yeah, yeah, I'd like to learn a lot more about those motors because going out and trying to buy commercial motors to build a robot arm even is a real difficult chore. Yeah. Anything anything that has any power and does what you want, you know, five, six hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. Oh boy. Prepare for incoming rant. Um <laughs> <laughs> I just had somebody share with me that they were all excited about a new BLDC motor controller. I'll try to look up the name of it and post it, but basically it was a replacement for the O-Drives. They were complaining about how expensive O-Drives are for BLDC motors. Um, leaving out, which you pointed out, Bob, the BLDC motors are expensive. And I mean, I, I tried years ago to get people excited about DC motors, old school you know, garbage DC motors. I mean, it's not like you can get them for free, he says sarcastically while linking to Facebook Marketplace with any number of ads for free treadmills. Um, you know, practically every treadmill out there has an old school DC motor and it'll do a horsepower or more. I mean, they're, they're the ones that I have, I have three of them here that I got for free. They're each two horsepower. Um, and, and of course, the reason why you, you're not legally allowed to use DC motors anymore is because 
uh, you can't expect people to replace brushes. You know, that's just insane. Every 5,000 hours having to go in there and replace the brushes, I mean, gee, that's crazy. You, you, you know, that, that's, that's, that's against the law. You can't make people do that. And also, you know, it's completely I impossible. <laughs> I love you guys. That's, that's, that's the right answer. Um, and, and then the other thing is that, of course, you know, it's impossible to use a DC motor to, to make a servo, he says sarcastically. Um, and, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, I've, I've made an absolutely massive servo, one foot square, solid steel, that'll lift a human being up off the ground and position them within uh, a degree or two uh, on the output shaft. Um, and, uh, and, and controllable, you know, over the ethernet. So, I mean, the equivalent of an uh, ether uh, cat, which you can't get anymore, or this new controller, which is ethernet based. The point of the matter is old DC motors and old PID controllers and all that kind of stuff are archaic. I mean, I made that whole thing. Uh, I believe my total cost on it was less than 50 bucks, uh, not including the steel for the case, because that was relatively expensive. Um, but, you know, if I had used rusted metal and welded it up, I would have been less expensive. But what did it take? It took a magnetic encoder, which cost like 10 bucks. It took uh, a DC motor driver that could do forward and reverse, um, which I think was $30. And then it took a pit controller, which I wrote in, in, in a pick, uh, and and put the whole thing together. And it took step and direction as an input, so you could run an adapter cable off of a, a 3D printer controller, because that's what I was interested in doing with it. But you can you know control it however you want to. And I I just think DC motors are amazing, and people should use them more for robotics. Okay, thank you for attending my. TED talk. Well, well, I agree with you because the, uh, uh, you know, large BLDC motors are damned expensive, and uh, you can buy similar size, uh, just plain DC motors, uh, relatively inexpensive. But then you have to have the gearbox uh, to get them down from their three thousand or ten thousand RPM. That tends to get expensive too. Yeah, and it introduces slop and um, friction, and they're not super, super efficient. BLDCs are more efficient. So, yeah, there's there's advantages. I just think people get stuck on trying to do the more complicated thing and never do the crappy thing that they can do right now. And then, and then like, refine it later, you know? I don't know. That's just my thing. Well, I've been trying to build a, a robot arm and uh, finally found some DC motors that I could get for a quote unquote reasonable price. And basically what they are is garage door openers. Yeah. The other, <laughs> the other, one, uh, the other spot I've seen uh, motors harvested from is old electric wheelchairs. Um, we had somebody who, uh, not seeing him on there, and I'm not remembering his name any, at the moment. But he had a uh, <clears throat> a robot he built actually using an old electric wheelchair, and he had a connect on it. It could roll around and stuff like that. But the uh, I think all the modern wheelchairs that are electric are moving more to the um, the lithium battery styles and probably use the brushless DCs. But I'm talking about the old electric ones that carried the lead acid batteries and stuff like you know um, that that group of you know, technology is kind of, you know, moving out these days, but, you know, I suspect the motors are still probably quite, uh, quite readily available in surplus. Okay. Does anybody have anything else they would like to jump into real quick, or we could go for a 10 minute break and then come back for the main, uh, the main uh, presentation. Break sounds good. Okay. I will set up a 10 minute timer. Folks, I'll keep the video running, um, but feel free to uh, you know, wander off, come back, and we'll start about 11 o'clock. Mm -hmm.
Okay, I'm back at least, and we're getting ready. How get started here in about eh, another three to five minutes. Say, Lloyd, I, I bopped in late. The simulator that was being demonstrated, where is that? Um, James, I, James, did you put the link to that in the chat? I didn't catch it. Um, I did put the link in the chat. I'm I'm happy to link to it again. I happen to have the page open here, so I'll just yeah. post it twice. Um, it's, oh, so it's basically just Tinkercad. People don't realize this, but Tinkercad has a really good, and by good, I mean useful, not accurate. <laughs> they have a really, <laughs> a really useful circuit simulator, um, and I've been using it to build up this selection of circuits for a light block uh, robot. Um, yeah. So that particular okay. one is... Uh, the servo for motor and encoder one, but the other ones all use a light sensor of some kind. To... Yeah, that was really cool. I've, I've never seen anything that comprehensive across different devices. Right, right. That's the thing that's cool about it is, is yeah. it, it isn't, it doesn't do any one thing perfectly, but it does like this wide range of it, things. It's beautiful for a conceptual understanding. Um, exactly. And and I, I love it for prototyping. I mean, I don't have to pull out the little wires and worry about bad connections or yeah. reality. You know, I can just live in that simulated world and build the circuits and all my circuits work. Um, I, I, I'm kind of in aerospace stuff these days. And if I'm doing a circuit simulation, I need it to be accurate. So that, that's not going to do it for me there. But L, LT yeah. Spice has been my friend for decades. And that's kind of my go-to. But it's nowhere yeah. near as easy to use. <laughs> So, so actually, and I really do, uh, I like LT Spice as well. Um, I'm not all that good at using it, to be honest with you. I usually end I'm in the same, forever. I'm in the same boat. I can get it to do what I need it to do when I can't do it some other way, but it, it's right. but, something I do daily. Well, what I've done in the past is, uh, what, I've, what I've started doing is I actually just use this little Tinkercad thing <laughs> to throw together something and look at it and kind of poke and prod it and see whether or not it has any hope of working at all. Yeah. And then the first couple of times after I did that, I would go to like LT Spice and really check it out, really, you know, like hone in the design or whatever. But just recently, I went directly from that to breadboarding the circuit. And then when the circuit that I breadboarded didn't work, then I went back to LT Spice and said, right. uh, oh, why isn't this working? <clears throat> And and then and then corrected it. I just it's it, the the thing about the Tinkercad thing is it's really good for just very very quickly tossing something together and kind of getting it down. And also I found it's really good for sharing things with people. Mm -hmm. Like you know you can kind of do hand waving on a video call or like try to draw something by hand. But um, it's really nice to be able to give yeah. somebody a combination of both like the circuit with the code um in a simulator where they can actually see it running right yep um and you know the scope on there or 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 have the little arduino or whatever logging out values and and you know convey it to somebody so on top of the educational thing i think you know you you hit on it there with the idea that it's really good for um Understanding in the sense that you can convey something to someone else quickly mm -hmm. so they can understand what it is you're talking about. Yeah. 
Okay, do we have everybody back? It's about 11 o'clock. So I think we'll move into the, uh, the the more formal portion of the meeting, which is, I'm sorry, but it's going to continue to be me talking. Uh, <laughs> I tried to get Chaz to host today, but he was tied up. So um, let's see, let me go ahead and share another screen. And... Okay, can people still hear me okay? Uh, somebody say something because I tweaked my, uh, the way the sound is going yeah. through. Okay, so we're good we're to good. go. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm Lloyd, you guys pretty much know who I am, so I'm not gonna introduce myself much more than that. Uh, this is all CUDA without a PhD. So for folks who are not familiar with what CUDA is, CUDA is the, I'm gonna call it, it's not really a language, it's basically a framework and an ecosystem for accessing the processors on the GPU card and programming them in a massively parallel, um, you know, with, for a massively parallel application. And we'll get into a little bit more about what that is at the moment. Um, for the agenda, we're going to talk about the GPU architecture. We'll go a little deeper into what CUDA is. I'll show you how to set this up on a Windows machine. Um, not that that's your only choice. You can run Windows and Linux. I believe the Mac environment for CUDA has been pretty well deprecated at this point. You can't really buy Macs that have NVIDIA GPUs recently either. At least everything I've seen has been AMD processors. So we're going to kind of be in the Linux and Windows space with this, with this talk. Then what we're going to do is we're going to put together a quick little problem definition. And I'm going to code this up for a single threaded uh, solution. And we'll look at how that's done. Then I'm going to convert that into a GPU massively parallel solution. And we'll compare the two. And I'll show you how to make this transition. Um, we'll talk about debugging resource or debugging CUDA kernels, which is how you debug something, and resources, and then we'll do a little QA. Okay, so quick disclaimer, CUDA is a very deep topic. Um, people can and do spend major portions of their career doing this. The, um, the data access patterns, the memory bandwidth, the processor topology, all, you know, all of this comes into really, really, really optimizing a, a solution to run on CUDA. That's not what this talk is about. What I my goal for this talk is to give you a tool that you can very easily pick up and use within an hour or two to go from a you know a single threaded or you know simple um, small number of core application to being able to access CUDA and use you know thousands of processors for a very common but fairly narrow use case. Um, and when we get into this, you'll see this is, um, it's a very, very common use case. They used to call it vector processing back in the day. You can do some of this on a, um, and some you get some of it for free <clears throat> with the uh, vector instruction sets on the processor and so forth. But we're gonna talk about how you do this in CUDA. If you're interested in getting into the real depths of CUDA and programming the NVIDIA uh, processors, uh, the, the uh, link there, uh, HTTPS docs, NVIDIA.com, CUDA docs, index HTML, they have wonderful documentation on how to do this um, as much as you ever wanna know. <laughs> They go into the architecture, they go into the tool sets, they go into optimizing the tool sets. There's um, a CUDA developer days, I believe they call it developer days, you know, uh, conference that every year. There's a ton of information on how to do this. The goal here again is distilling all that down and showing you a, a simple way to get started for a very common use case. And you're not gonna get the maximum speed up that you could, but you're going to get plenty of speed up to make it worth the time to, to do this. 
Okay, first thing we need to talk about. Oh, if, um, folks, just a quick note too. If there's questions, uh, go ahead and open the mic and say something. Um, as I mentioned, I'm uh, not at my normal desktop when I'm doing this. So I've got one screen and right now it's showing the slides. So if somebody uh, has a question, uh, just pop, a, pop the mic open and ask it. I won't be able to see anything else. Okay, so first thing we need to talk about is GPU architecture. And I'm gonna contrast this with what a modern CPU does. A modern CPU has a small number of complex processors. They're mostly independent from one another, but the cache being the, uh, the obvious point where they're connected. And they generally work on independent tasks. <clears throat> so you've got a typical processor or a typical system has got say four to 16 complex processors and they're typically doing completely different things, not related in any way to each other. That computational pattern is generally referred to as SISD or single instruction, single data. Okay, that's the, the pattern we've generally been using. A modern GPU consists of hundreds to thousands of processors. They're much, much, much simpler and they work together to perform the same operation on multiple pieces of data in parallel. And we're gonna get into a little bit more about what that is in a minute. This computational pattern is SIMD, or single instruction, multiple data. So you've got one instruction and you're performing that same instruction on multiple pieces of data at the same time. NVIDIA actually expands on this a little bit. <clears throat> And they have a, um, an acronym called SIM, uh, SIMT, Single Instruction Multiple Thread. And the difference there is, instead of performing the same exact instruction on multiple data at exactly the same time, they allow the execution to vary slightly. And I'm not sure exactly what the, the difference there is, but basically um, it gives you a performance increase if you've got an if statement, right? you don't stall all your other processors while one is handling <clears throat> the true or false case of a particular if statement. And I'm gonna kind of leave it at that. Uh, the GPU likes to work in 32-bit floating point. Um, basically it likes to, it's a 32-bit processor. Let's just say it that way. 32-bit floating point or integer. 64-bit um, is typically supported, but you do take a time uh, penalty for the additional precision. Uh, the other thing I'm not going to talk about much, there are a ton of additional floating point formats coming out, This is, and they're supported in hardware. Um, this is primarily for the AI applications. Um, for right now, I'm going to kind of make the assumption that the work we're doing is more kind of in the realm of scientific computing, and you know, we're trying to do the same type of work we would do on a CPU on the GPU just faster. So I'm not gonna do any of the, we're not gonna get into any of the newer floating point formats. Um, it's another place you can go get a PhD in that if you really want to. So from this description, the GPU offers an effective speed up in the following use case. So this is going to be the data pattern and the data manipulation pattern that we're gonna talk about. So you've got a lot of data large, a very large data set that needs to be processed. Think hundreds of megabytes or gigabytes of data, right? And this could be imagery coming in. So it's not hard to get a lot of this data. The data format is regular. In other words, it's stored in arrays or vectors or you know tables, right? It's not like you know arbitrary structures or databases or anything like that. This is simple arrays of numbers you need to perform the same or very similar operations on each element. The operations are also independent, okay? And so basically you're, um, when we say independent, basically we're gonna just process a list of numbers, right? And I'll, I'll show you an example of this in a minute. Um, if you get, data patterns that are not completely independent, there's ways to do that. 
<clears throat> and there's other algorithms that are specialized for doing that. Like for instance, adding an entire vector of numbers and summarizing it. That's not necessarily an independent operation, um, but there's ways to do that on the GPU as well. Um, it just takes a little more work. And the amount of work to be performed is on each element is significant enough to justify copying the data at least twice. So let's go through these. I, this is a little bit of a um, abstract or um, academic description of some of this. Let's go through and look at this in a little more practical uh, sense. So the first thing we want to talk about is the GPU memory architecture. The GPU, and you can see this when you buy these, they, cont they contain a dedicated bank of memory, and that's independent from the, the normal CPU memory. So normal CPU memory is typically accessed or designed for, well, what a normal CPU does. I go access it in a linear fashion because I'm executing instructions or data, and I've got caches. GPU memory is optimized for highly parallel access patterns, <laughs> different access patterns. So you've got an independent set of memory, and this memory is specialized in the way it's accessed um, for what the GPU is going to do to it, okay? <clears throat> when you're gonna process information on the GPU, you need to copy it from over to, uh, you need to copy the information from the CPU memory to the GPU memory. The CPU memory is called host memory, and the GPU memory is called device memory. So folks that work with microcontrollers, you're, you're already used to this. You know, different processors tend to have different banks of memory. And, you know, the, the PICs are notorious for this. The 8051s are, you know, they have these page memories and things like that. The, the GPU has that same type of thing. You, have, you now have different banks of memory that are optimized to do different usage, uh, different use patterns, or use cases. Okay, so what you do is you load the data into your CPU memory or the host memory, then you copy it to the GPU memory, which is called device memory. Then you do your work on it, and then you can do more work on it in the GPU memory, or you copy it back to host memory. So as you can see, there's at least two copies in there. And that's got overhead, right? So the amount of memory or the amount of work you want to do in your process, um, you want to have enough of it that it's at least two copies worth of data. So, you know, if you're just going to add a couple of numbers together, eh, probably not worth doing this. Your copy overhead is going to kill your performance. But um, as you'll see in a minute, there's, there's other things you can do that, that justify this. Um, there are... Just, just to expand a little bit, there are things called unified memory, shared memory, and texture memory. Um, I'm not going to talk about those. Those each have very specific use cases in the GPU. And despite the fact that they have, um, like in the case of shared memory and texture memory, <clears throat> um, that tends to come from the graphics world. Um, there's things you can do with that in the, in the scientific computing uh, world as well, but I'm not going to talk about that too much in this talk. That, that's a little more advanced topic. Okay, let's go through and talk about what NVIDIA CUDA is. This is a framework and a set of tools which allow for application development on the NVIDIA GPU hardware. Um, there's a reference to the top level documentation. Brief summary, there's a couple main components to this. There's the, the NVIDIA compiler, which is NVCC. There's the CUDA API, which is basically like any other framework API. And then you've got some de uh, debugging and profiling tools called Insight Compute. You also have a bunch of math libraries uh, and support libraries for this. So CU BLAS is a linear algebra. It's a linear algebra library that's uh, optimized for the uh, GPU. Uh, CUFFT is Fast Fourier Transforms, again, optimized for the GPU. Uh, RAND is a random number generator. Tensor is um, matrix processing. Sparse is sparse ma matrix processing. Solver is, you know, just what it sounds like. It's a uh, equation solver. Uh, JPEG is for JPEGs. 
uh, JPEG uh, imagery. Thrust, uh, we're actually gonna look at Thrust. Thrust helps manage um, copying things back and forth between the uh, GPU and CPU memory. And then you've also got some technologies like GPU direct storage. So once you get into this, there's a, there's a lot of tools to help you do this very easily. Okay, the first thing you need to do <clears throat> is get CUDA up and running on your, uh, on your uh, development system or your development computer. Uh, CUDA runs on Windows and Linux environments, uh, specifically x86, x, uh, uh, x86-64. Also runs on ARM hardware, so the uh, Jetson series of boards. Uh, some people in this group are starting to look at using uh, the Jetson hardware for the Robo Magellan challenges. Just a little hint that, you know, here's some practical application for you. Uh, for this exercise, I'm going to use the following configuration. It's going to be a Windows system. Um, note, this is just how we're going to talk about some benchmarks and stuff. So I'm, I'm giving you this so you know what I'm using to benchmark. This is not a minimum recommended configuration. This just happens to be what I'm using. Uh, it's an AMD Ryzen 9, which is a mo the modern uh, AMD processor. It's a 16 core, 32 thread, four and a half gigahertz uh, processor. So it's a modern processor. Uh, motherboard is just a ASUS, you know, um, roughly middle of the road process uh, motherboard. A uh, bunch of RAM, not super fast, but there. Uh, the video card I'm using is a GeForce RTX 4080 with 16 gigabytes of RAM. That is, um, it's about one step down from the top of the line. I'm running Windows OS, uh, Windows 11 Pro, 64-bit. Uh, and we're going to do this in uh, Visual Studio Community Edition. That's free and it's pretty simple to set up. And I did this under CUDA 12.2. Okay, so first thing we need to do is set up the tool chain. Um, this is, just happens to be the tool chain I'm using at the moment because, well, it's simple. Uh, there's much more complex and different things you can do with this, including running it on Linux, running it through Windows system for Linux 2. Um, but this is simple. All you have to do is go install Microsoft Visual Studio Community, Community Edition, and there's the link. Uh, just go to the link and you'll get an installer and configure it at least for C++ development. So that's pretty straightforward. Next thing you have to do is install the NVIDIA CUDA from Microsoft Visual Studio. That's the link. Again, just go click the link, hit install, and it just comes right up for you. Um, I'm making the assumption you've already got the a, a NVIDIA GPU of some type installed. It doesn't have to be a modern one per se. It doesn't have to be a fancy one. Um, but your know, Windows installs the driver for the uh, video card automatically. And if you do this, you're pretty well set up. So that's one of the reasons I chose Linux, or excuse me, chose Windows for this talk. The setup is super, super simple. Uh, Linux and the other configurations are quite a bit more involved. Okay, <clears throat> are folks with me so far? Again, I can't see anybody, so... Um, I'm not hearing any questions. Are people with me? Did I lose anybody? Has everybody gone to sleep? I'm excited. Okay, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's get into the problem definition. So you know, I gave a, I gave kind of a laundry <laughs> list of, hey, here's all the traits that you know a good problem for this needs to have, and um, you know that sounded kind of rather academic. Let's. For this example, what I'm going to do is we're just going to take a series of um, two vectors and we're going to assume they're the sides of a triangle and we're going to compute the hypotenuse of the triangle, right? And I chose this because, well, it's pretty simple. It's a reasonable amount of work. So if you look at the little equation over here, where's my mouse? If you look at the little equation here, I'm going to take each number, I'm going to square it, I'm going to add it together, and I'm going to take the square root. Okay, that, that's a few operations. There's um, you know, one, two, three. There's four operations in there, a couple of which are significantly more complicated than just adding, right? So I've got 
two series of numbers. I can represent them in vectors, right? They're just a list of numbers. They're independent. Um, for each, for each A and B, it doesn't depend on anything else. I can do them all in parallel, and there's a reasonable amount of work here. You know, squ uh, squaring a number and taking the square root is quite a bit more work than just copying the number. So, okay, I've, I've met the criteria. This is a, a reasonable pattern of a problem to, to throw to the GPU. And, and keep in mind, you know, this is a, a bit artificial in that we're just doing squ um, square root, but this could be, take a, um, an image for instance, right? If I want to do a, a blur of an image, right? That's the image is basically a vector. I can recompute each pixel independently of all the others. So, and that gives me a whole bunch of data I could just throw to the GPU and do it all in parallel. Um, this is just a simpler version of that that's easier to talk about. Okay, so for this, uh, for this example, we're gonna start off by creating two vectors of random numbers, call them A and B. We're gonna compute the results using a single threaded approach on the CPU. Then we're gonna pass it over to the GPU and let the GPU do it. And we're gonna compare the results and see how long we, uh, or see how much speed up we get. For this example, we're just gonna keep this in 32-bit floating point. Um, normally you, you know, kind of tend to use doubles because that's what the CPU likes to do. Um, but for this example, we're just gonna say 32-bit floating point because that's what the GPU likes to do. Okay, first thing is in Visual Studio, you wanna create a project. So I'm assuming you've gotten through the install of Visual Studio and you bring it up and basically just go here, create a new project, okay? When you create a new project, it's going to ask you what type of project do you want to create? Um, and you've installed the CUDA toolkit, so you'll create a CUDA, um, CUDA runtime project. That's all you really need to do to bring CUDA into your Visual Studio project. And now it's very much like C and C++. Um, you're going to give the project a name, you're going to give it a location, and you're going to give your solution a name. Again, pretty much all the same stuff you do to create a new C++ project. And then you're going to get presented with a block of C++ code. Okay, I did not put the full sample in here. Um, I just truncated for it to fit on the slide. A couple things to notice. Um, the example that gives you just as a boilerplate uh, has a main, same as, you're, same as you're used to. There's some data. Um, it just creates a couple of arrays for you. And then basically this example just adds five numbers together with CUDA. And so it copies it over to the GPU and um, adds a couple of numbers together. Now, as we mentioned, this isn't going to give you any speed up, <clears throat> right? I'm taking five numbers, I'm throwing them over to the device memory or copying them to device memory. So that's got an overhead. Then I'm gonna call this CUDA kernel thing, which we'll talk about more. And that tells the GPU to go add these numbers up. Then I'm gonna copy them back. That's a lot of overhead to just add a couple of numbers together. So this is a great um, example to illustrate the basics of what you're gonna do, but don't expect this to give you a real speed up. Okay, when you um, go ahead and start programming CUDA, just like you're gonna add a C++ class, um, you have to add your, your header file and your implementation file for CUDA. This is a little bit different. What you need to do is go in and say, add a CUDA header file or a CUDA, he CUDA header or a CUDA file, and basically do this in place of your .h and your .cpp file. And what you're gonna see is CUH, and um, forgot the, uh, what the, basically there's gonna be a CU in front of them. And that tells the, that tells the uh, build system, these are CUDA files, build them with the, the CUDA compiler, which is NVCC. 
So that's how you tell the system, this code is for the GPU, okay? Um, actually what's happening, I'm not gonna get too deep into this. The, basically the CUDA compiler is going to build them and it's gonna pass stuff back to the regular compiler. There's a bit of a meta language uh, built into this. We'll get into that in a minute. So the two compilers are really working a little more together than uh, this implies. But you, the key point here is you have to tell the system, hey, this, this file contains code that's, debt or that's targeted to, to the GPU. And that's what you're doing by saying a CUDA um, file or a CUDA header. <clears throat> okay, so uh, let's back off of that. Let's just build a single C++ file that's going to hold our, um, our single threaded code. So I'm going to make a class called CUDA worker. And this is pretty straightforward. Um, basically, I'm going to take, oh, what do I have in here? Uh, I think that's 100 million um, 100 million um, elements, right? So I'm just gonna say, I'm gonna take 100 million triangles and I'm gonna compute the uh, hypotenuse of them. So this is just basically a straight up uh, header file, just like C++, it's CUDA worker. Um, I'm gonna disable the special member functions. We don't need them. Um, if you're into C++ coding, this is rule of three, rule of five type of stuff. So it just keeps it simple. And then I'm going to create a function called CPU compute. This will compute the hypotenuse for this 100 million triangles with the CPU. Then I'm going to do one for the GPU. And then we're going to verify them and make sure that what the CPU did is exactly what the GPU did. OK, so that, that's the little class. Basically, three functions. Do the work with the CPU. Do the work with the GPU double check yourself and make sure you got what you think you got. Okay, and to do that, we need a set of vectors. So I'm gonna use this library called Thrust. Um, and basically you see I included up here, include Thrust host vector and device vector. What Thrust is, it's a library, um, I don't know if it's distributed by NVIDIA or not, I think it is, um, but it basically wraps the host memory and device memory, and gives you vectors very much like making a couple of vectors, right? Nothing fancy here, except for there's a host vector and a device vector. So when I create a host vector of float, that's gonna allocate CPU memory or the main memory that you used to. When I create a device vector, that's gonna allocate it on the GPU memory. That's really the only difference and only special thing about thrust, is it very easily lets you handle these two memory banks. And you notice I just call them A and B, and for the device side, I call them device A and device B, right? Okay, so. One more little complexity, but it's not bad. Okay, um, I actually kind of already jumped ahead and talked about this slide, but uh, this is just highlighting. I've got vectors on the host. I've got vectors on the device, okay? And notice I've also got a CPU result, a GPU result, and then down here, a device result, okay? So A and B are the inputs, result is the output. Okay, next thing I'm going to do is I need to fill up my input vectors. So this is pretty much just straightforward, simple code. Um, if you're not into this in C++ too deep, I take A and B, I reserve uh, for my vector size. This just pre-allocates memory. So as I fill up the vector, I'm not reallocating memory. Uh, then I take and build up a random number uh, generator. I'm just using std default random uh, random number generator. And uh, this is just a C, like any other random number generator. I'm gonna go from zero to 100, 
and just generate a bunch of floating point random numbers. So all this loop does is generate a random number, shove it into A. Generate a random number, shove it into B. Do Hang that. on a second, Lloyd. I've got to ask you a question here real quick. Yep. Did, did you just call that stud? Stood, yeah. Stood. <laughs> yep. Is that, that uh, like, I've never heard anybody read code before, so I'm like, really? It's not... <laughs> Okay. All right. I just, yeah. sorry, I couldn't let that go by. That's, that's interesting. I got to remember that one. Yep. No. Nope. So if you're in the, yeah, if you're in the C++ world, um, they generally call the standard library instead of reading out STD, a lot of people just say stood. <laughs> it's not stud, it's stood. But sorry, that's just kind of a C++ ism. That, yeah. Slipped you missed your opportunity to build yourself up there a little. <laughs> 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 no, no, nothing, nothing fancy like that. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, yeah, all I'm doing is using the standard library to build up a bunch of random number generators and shove them into my vectors. Okay, here's the cool thing about the thrust library. I want to copy, well, I need to copy my the vector that I just built up, built up in CPU memory. I need to copy that to device memory. All I do is assign it. Device A equals A. Under the covers, that's going to do all the work of setting up the memory, getting it onto the device, copying the memory from the host to the device, and synchronizing and doing everything else that really needs to be done. OK. So single threaded. All right, CPU compute. Um, basically, it's just a for loop. And for every element, or for every pair of elements, you know, I'm, I'm doing this in a particular way with pointers. Um, you'll see why I do that in a minute. There's, there's a simpler way to do this, but um, this do Pythagorean, I'm going to use in both cases. So I grab a pointer to my A. I grab a pointer to my B. I grab a pointer to my result. And I pass my pointers to a function called do Pythagorean. And basically, do Pythagorean just implements the formula that um, I talked about before. Now, notice that do Pythagorean is tagged with under underscore device and underscore underscore host. This is part of the CUDA um, meta language. Okay, these are attributes to the NBCCC compiler to build this function so it runs both on the CPU and the GPU. So remember I said the two compilers work together? This particular block of code will be passed to both compilers and two sets of instructions will be generated. Um, there's also a global, let's see if I got this. There's also a global attribute um, we'll talk about more about that in a second. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oops. Sorry about that. Me... There we go. Okay. So this is basically what we need to do to do a single threaded GPU. Uh, main, I instantiate a GPU. I'm not using it yet. Don't worry about that. Um, I instantiate my CUDA worker. I basically um, start a timer. I tell my worker to do a CPU compute. I stop a timer. I print it out. Um, just for brevity, I've got the uh, GPU in here as well. I do exactly the same thing. I start a timer, do the work with the GPU, stop the timer. The constructor has already put things in the right place. And then I verify. OK. Now let's talk about how to do this in a massively parallel sense. Is, every, is everybody with me? So let's go back one step. Is everybody with me so far? This is pretty straightforward code. I'm taking two vectors of numbers. I'm doing a Pythagorean theorem on them and I'm printing out the results and I'm doing it with the CPU. Everybody comfortable with that so far? Yes. Okay. Now we're gonna do it on the GPU. Okay, so we're just going to convert this. So instead of doing one thing at a time, I'm going to do a whole bunch of these numbers in parallel. So you notice I had this class called GPU. All that is is a little helper class. 
and it just instantiates the GPU and initializes it and prints out some some uh, characteristics of the GPU. Uh, CUDA set device. And by the way, folks, I will post all the code with this as well. So don't worry about memorizing code. Basically, to initialize a GPU, all you do is say CUDA set device. So CUDA is the prefix for the uh, CUDA API. And you can do this in C or C++. Um, CUDA set device, you give it the default card, which is zero. I'm only using one GPU at the moment. Uh, make sure it works. If it doesn't, spit up an error. And then basically I print out some stats, the capability of the card, how many multiprocessors it's got, the core count, the max threads per block, et cetera. Okay. And the destructor cleans up the GPU with this CUDA device reset. That's all you have to do to clean up a GPU. So that brings your GPU into the world, lets you talk to it, and then it cleans it up afterwards. Okay. A block of code that runs on the GPU is called a kernel. And there's an instance of the kernel that is run on each core of the processor as an independent thread. So this is the mindset you have, to, this is the mental leap you have to do to get onto um, the GPU. Essentially imagine you've got a vector of array, uh, a vector of numbers, and every element of that vector is going to go to a different processor or potentially a different processor, okay? From the developer's point of view, this is just a function call. CUDA manages all this for you under the covers, but each processor and kernel has what's called a thread address, okay? Mm -hmm. so the, next, the next thing we're gonna do is get you, work on getting you past this mental hurdle of taking your data, which has got an index, right? So when you're accessing the array, you typically go by an index and mapping that index to a thread address, okay? So what I'm gonna do is take each individual element and instead of doing them in order, I'm gonna take a block of them, say a thousand of them. I'm gonna take that entire thousand at one time and I'm gonna throw that to a thousand different processors. And it's going to do all thousand of them in parallel. In the traditional graphics processing world, what they did is each one of these little processors was responsible for determining the color of a pixel. So you can imagine in a in a picture, every pixel being handled by a dedicated processor. Okay. Uh, if you want to get more into this, um, this this really helped me get my mind wrapped around this. There's a web, website called Shader Toy, and I won't go into it, but it, it lets you play with this process in a graphical sense and in a virtualized environment where you don't have to install anything on your own processor or your own computer. It's all a website, you just do it. Um, okay. <clears throat> so what we do is here's GPU compute. This is basically performing the same function as CPU compute. You're given a couple of things. Um, so we pick up GPU max threads per block. Okay. And just that's, and for the moment, just kind of take this verbatim. Um, this is how many threads you can do per block. GPUs like to organize their processors into blocks. And then the size is the number of blocks is the vector size divided by the number of threads or the max GPU per block plus one. So you can think of max threads per block is this is essentially the number of threads or the number of elements I can work with at one time in parallel per block. Okay. So that's my number of threads. And then I'm going to divide up my number of block or my vector by the number of threads that gives me the number of blocks. Here's the next little piece of magic. Um, I'm going to create this thing called Pythagorean kernel, and I'm going to invoke it. And I'm going to tell it I want this number of blocks, this number of threads, and then here's my data. What this does, this tells the CUDA compiler and uh, runtime system to create a kernel and launch it and do it in parallel. 
the number of blocks and number of threads will be used by the system under the covers to basically automatically map this to, to the geometry of your hardware. So what we're really doing here is saying, I've got this linear vector of numbers, right? Just a bunch of numbers, chop them up so that it matches my hardware and we can do this effectively, okay? And here's the thing to do, La launch a kernel for every one of these things on a different processor and make sure I get everything done. That, that's really all we're doing here. Um, all this next step is, is get last error. Uh, did the kernel successfully launch, right? All I'm doing in this, this first if block, did I get the kernel launch? Next block is device synchronize. That's wait for my kernel to complete. So basically chop up all my work, launch it against the hardware, make sure that went okay, and wait for it. Okay, everybody with me so far? Okay. Yep. So invoking a kernel looks like, just like a regular function call with these this extra notation. So this literally is three less thans, the number of blocks, the number of threads, and three greater thans, okay? For our example, these are just simple numbers. In reality, um, CUDA under the covers, these are three-dimensional uh, structures. So I can have three dimensions of threads, three dimensions of blocks, when you get into this more, that allows you to not only map against the hardware, it allows you to map a three-dimensional problem space to your hardware. So imagine I'm running a 3D simulation and I've got every little voxel I want to run on a separate uh, CUDA core. This is how you do it. Don't go there yet. Get, get the one-dimensional case figured out first and get comfortable with that. Once you do that, doing it in three dimensions is not a big deal. So just just to ask a question here real quick, the, yep. the three dimensions, is that is that like the hardware limitation of the of the NVIDIA hardware? I'm just curious as to where three comes from. I mean, I understand that in gaming, three dimensions is important, but it, like if you were using this for neural networks, more would be nice. Right. Three dimensions literally comes from the gaming hardware space or the gaming space. Keep in mind. So that is a that's that's they built the hardware for the gaming space, and therefore there is a hardware limitation of three dimensions. Okay. Correct. And matter of fact, the hardware is not three dimensions. The hardware is you basically think of it as single dimensions, but the API is three dimensional because that's the problem space in the gaming world. Does that make sense? So it's, it's not really, don't think about the hardware and what it's doing. That's that's changing under the covers all the time. The problem okay. space- but The this API was, um, is optimized for, for this gaming world. Exactly. Okay, okay. Yep. okay. that and, makes and sense. All, yeah, and because we live in a three-dimensional world, um, ignoring time, it also happens to work really well for physics simulations. So the, the three dimensions is really coming from, we live in a three-dimensional world, Therefore, we build video games in a three-dimensional world. We do physics simulations in a three-dimensional world, and hence the API is three-dimensional, <laughs> right? That's really how it's coming out. For, for the subset of physics up through a certain right. point. But yes, exactly. okay, good enough, good enough. Exactly. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna do is we're making this thing called uh, a kernel. And global, okay, so here's this global thing we hinted at earlier. But this is the Pythagorean, Pythagorean kernel. This is a little block of code that's going to launch on every processor. You're given a thread ID. So thread ID or thread IDX dot X, block IDX dot X, and block dimension. Thread IDX, block IDX, and block dimension are variables that are global and supplied to you uniquely by the system. So every thread that launches gets a unique um, unique set of these variables. You put them together just like this. It's essentially um, the same way you would translate a two-dimensional um, array in C 
back into a one dimension. And this gives you an index. This is called your thread index. This first line is computing what piece of data is this particular thread going to work with. And then I'm going to check that index and make sure it's less than my vector, right? Okay, because I may launch, um, because I can only launch things in certain blocks, I may launch actually more threads than I have data. So basically all I'm doing is saying, if, if my thread index, if this piece of data I'm going to work on is in my data set, go ahead and do Pythagorean. And this is the same piece of code that we did for the, the CPU. Okay, global, when you tag something with global, it runs on the GPU. It can be called from either the CPU or the GPU. Device runs on the GPU and it's called from the GPU. Host runs on the CPU and it's called from the CPU. Okay, and you can combine these. The compiler will just, this is just telling the compiler, build this for this processor and provide a call interface for this processor. That's all you're doing here. Okay. Um, let's see. So basically this is kind of what I just said. The thread index contains the address of the current thread. The block index contains the address of the current block. The block dimension contains the geometry. Um, we're only using the X dimension, but these are really 3D. And you just combine them and that basically lets you reach into the vector and grab the single piece of data that this thread is going to work on. All, you know, let's just say we've got a thousand threads. All thousand threads will get different values for these variables and they'll each pick up their own piece of data. Okay. Okay, let's pull all this together. Is everybody generally with me? Okay, this is something you have to get your mind wrapped around. So I don't expect everybody to be completely with me, but when you go to do this the first time, it, it, uh, your, your mind will bend slightly and then it'll come back. So let's show, what I wanna show next is how this CPU compute turned into GPU compute. Okay, because it's basically a one-to-one -one mapping on the way the control, the control logic is structured. So in CPU compute, I had a four and basically I equals zero, I less than vector size, right? So I'm going through sequentially in the CPU. That basically maps to this number of threads, number of blocks and invoking the Pythagorean um, kernel. Right? So instead of going through the data sequentially, I'm going to translate that into a parallel structure and launch them all in parallel. Okay, part number two, getting the data. Computing all these pointers basically turns into this single instruction here of getting my thread ID, my block ID, and my block dimensions and computing the uh, elements to my data, right? So instead of just this simple thing, I'm going to compute all of this stuff in parallel and um, do it per thread. And then you just call do Pythagorean. This is exactly the same function in both cases. The compiler just compiles it for both environments. Once you get familiar with this pattern, you can take any massive or any huge sequential loop that matches the properties and turn it into GPU code in about 30 to 60 minutes. Okay. Verification. Yes, that, that whole thing makes a lot more sense if you worked with FPGAs in the past. Yeah, it uh, does. Yep. You got to get your head into the parallel world. <laughs> Okay, normally you don't have to do a verify routine, but all verify does is I'm just gonna compare the results and make sure they're equal. This is just a sanity check. Okay, results. So when I run this, um, you can see my GPU constructor. In my case, I'm running G, uh, compute capability 8.9. This tells you what, your, um, what things you can do on the processor and what floating point formats are supported and a whole bunch of this type of stuff. It's basically the version number for your hardware. 
I've got 76 multiprocessors, 128 CUDA cores. Um, so there's 128 CUDA cores per multiprocessor. And that gives me 9,728 CUDA cores. This basically means I can launch 9,728 threads at the same time. Okay. Uh, max threads per multiprocessor and max threads per block. I'm going to skip over this a little bit. Uh, you saw me using them. This is basically how CUDA is going to map onto the hardware. Um, when I did the GPU compute, or excuse me, the CPU compute, that took about 10.7 milliseconds. When I did it on the GPU, it took about two milliseconds. So I got about a 52, about a 52 times speed up. This does not include the copy overhead. And clearly, the, I'm just showing one particular run of, uh, you know, you should do this more than once to get your metrics. This is a very unoptimized solution. Um, if I really start digging into this and mapping it and had a better problem uh, to work on, you can get about a thousand X speed up uh, with full effort. Um, for real problems, I typically see a 100 to 200 X speed up. Um, and that, that's kind of a general range. Let's see. So let me hit debugging real quick. I'm getting close on time. So I'm going to skip through a little bit and I want a little bit of time for questions. When you're debugging, um, the problem you run into is there's typically thousands of instances running, right? It's it's when you put a breakpoint, it's like, where's my breakpoint? There's a thousand of these things running, or in my case, 9,000 plus of these things running, right? <clears throat> so some simple guidelines, place the work to be done in a function like I did here, and get that function working by itself. That gets all your math and you know basic process out of the way. You don't have to debug that in CUDA land. When you start, you can reduce your kernel to one invocation. So just say function one comma one, right? So that'll just run the first one. So now you're not running with a thousand invocations. You're just running with one. That, that's very helpful. And then once you get one working, do two, right? Most of what you'll run into will be addressing issues. Once you've got that working, you can use printf in CUDA just like you would in any other um, any other um, environment, right? You just put printf and it works inside CUDA. CUDA handles all the details of getting the printf onto and off of the GPU for you. And you can also use breakpoints. Once you're once you're doing this with printf and breakpoints, and you've cut your workspace down to just one or two running at a time, it's pretty much just de like debugging any other code. Um, what you're mostly going to run into is that mapping and getting your pointers correct. You're going to map off into the twilight zone, and um, but you know that that's people doing C and C plus plus. You're used to that. Okay, additional resources. I've really barely just scratched the surface of what can be done. Goal is to give you a simple and effective solution to a common problem. This is just the beginning of the journey. So here's the links to the main, uh, the official documentation. <clears throat> There's also a couple of good books I've read. Uh, Programming in Parallel with CUDA uh, is an excellent book and also Programming Massively Parallel Processors. Both of those um, will help get you into the full depth of this. And then I've also referenced uh, Shader Toy, which is another way to just play with this and get your head into this parallel space. And uh, with that, uh, any questions? I've got about five, 10 minutes before I have to depart. So uh, thoughts, comments, questions, anything I didn't quite get clear enough for folks? Yeah, I've got a quick question on, I'm still trying to wrap my head around just how many threads were running and what they were, <laughs> just the, uh, the the quantities that were involved. So that yep. function, the Pythagorean kernel was invoked 10 million times or whatever for however many yep. elements yep. in the vector, but it was invoked a certain number of times on each thread for a block, block yeah. number of times for each thread. So let, yeah, so let, let, let me say it this way. So we had, you know, we've been talking, we've got a hundred million elements, right? So the kernel was invoked 
a hundred million times, right? And basically it invoked a hundred million threads. Each of those threads was launched against a particular um, CUDA core, right? So you've got, in this case, I had 9,742 <clears throat> cores. So what's gonna happen is this thing's gonna get launched. It may not be exactly this, but the way to think about it, every single core that's available is going to have a thread launched against it. CUDA takes that 100 million threads and says, okay, I've got 100 million pieces of work to do. I've got 9,742 workers, and I'm just gonna launch these in waves against these workers, right? And that, that's what CUDA is really doing for you. It's managing the mapping of that big block of work. Here's how you break it down. Here's how you match it to the, to the geometry of the hardware. And basically it just gets it all done for you, right? Um, with the exception of, go back here. Oops. With the exception of this one little if statement to make sure that things come out even, you can just pretty much ignore ignore the details. Mm -hmm. Now, when you really get into trying to optimize these things, um, then it starts to matter because how you're launching, how you're launching your work against the kernel or against the available processors, the memory access patterns, all that type of stuff. <clears throat> that's where the really hard stuff gets into. But hey, if, you know, if you're happy with a 50 times speed up for a half an hour to an hour worth of work, good enough, right? <laughs> yeah, that was gonna be my next question was about that memory access. Is that optimized for free or you have to do a bunch of extra work to kind of Make kind sure you're, how you set up the memory. Yeah, there's a first level of this that's optimized for free. So if you really get into this thing, and I'm this is part of what I'm still trying to get my head around up. Do you have a basic understanding of how hyper-threading works against memory and against the caches? I think they share certain levels. Yeah, they share certain levels. And the idea is one processor in hyper-threading one processor will suspend while the other processor can continue to go do work. And so when you're waiting, the idea is when you're waiting on a memory access, one processor can quickly come in and do what it can do, and then you suspend it, then you flip back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, that's a little mind bending in and of itself. In On the GPU, that pattern is enhanced and expanded to like a depth of 16 or more. So while, while memory accesses are happening, um, the hardware is actually optimizing so you can, you can get as much work done as you can. The memory is accessed in very wide blocks. Um, in the case of if you're running like an A100 GPU, for instance, it uses what's called high bandwidth memory. Um, your memory bus width is 4,096 bit or bytes wide you're pulling in 4K of data per cycle, right? For this, it handles it. Um, for the access, for the uh, the way I set this uh, memory up, you know, it's, it's pretty straightforward. CUDA will just, and the hardware will just deal with it. If you're doing things more advanced, like neural networks or matrix multiplications or stuff like that, there is also another layer that you have to do um, manually. I'm still getting my head around that. <laughs> that that that's where a lot of the work of really getting things sped up comes from. Cool, that makes sense. Thank you. This was super interesting. Yeah, thank you. Okay, other questions. So I'm curious. Um, you 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 gave this talk. Obviously, you have uh, an idea for using this. I'm I'm curious what your intended uh, future uses or was this something that you like do at work and you thought other people might be interested in it or do you have a specific application especially if it's in robotics yeah so um my, my formal background's in ai so i've got an interest in this from the ai perspective although these days you know you've got tools like tensorflow and stuff like that that just kind of do all this for you and you don't have to worry about the low level details 
Um, I'm also in aerospace. It's actually what I do for my day job. In that particular case, we're dealing with massive amounts of data. Um, for instance, one of our test systems, well, I won't give too much detail, but one of our test systems can produce a gigabyte of data per minute of runtime. Um, so I'm looking at ways of, you know, how do we make sense of all that, right? You've got, you know, tens of gigabytes of data coming off per test and maybe one number is wrong, you know. And then um, the other place I'm looking, I, I use this a bit is in uh, financial analysis applications. So I've got multiple use cases for this. Cool. So one of them being the, the one most related to robotics would be neural networks. Yep. And and uh, implementing a neural network in a GPU or using a GPU to train a neural network or something like that. Exactly. Yep. That's that's pretty complicated stuff. It, so, yeah. Yep. I'm, I'm curious if you found any resources related to that. Like, have you found other people who are working on that? Oh, yeah, there, there's massive amounts of research on that. Go look at TensorFlow, go look at any of the, um, basically just go on to um, uh, NVIDIA's website and just look up AI. It's all over right now. All chat GPT, all the generative AIs, they're all doing this under the covers. There, there's massive amounts of resource uh, work going into this right now. But learning about how they're doing it is, is, it's kind of tricky. I mean, it's like, yeah, it's, like it's, using it's, ChatGPT is easy, but like understanding how ChatGPT or one of those makes use of GPUs in order to do training, that's a little bit harder to, yeah. to find documentation on. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's actually out there. Um, there's several talks on it. Um, just go in and look at the AI and big data forums. And NVIDIA's got a ton of this on their website. Just look up AI stuff on NVIDIA and they'll take you. Oh, cool. There's a lot of it out there right now. Awesome. Well, my application is uh, vision, yep. image processing. And so uh, uh, if you're using a CPU, it tends to be rather slow because you have massive amounts of data for each image. Right. Uh, using CUDA will speed it up significantly. Exactly. Yep. And, there, and to that end, there are CUDA libraries. Um, yeah. I believe OpenCV will actually interface with CUDA now as well. That's double, correct. Yes. Yeah. Double check me on that. So, yep, there's libraries to support that directly. Yeah, that means you don't have to write all of the, the details from scratch. You just call the routine. Exactly. Yep. But if you want to do something special, now you got some idea of how to do that, too. So. Yep. yep. Well, and it's always easier. I, I mean, especially when you're trying to use something that's that's way out in the stratosphere like this, right? Like yep. if you understand what's going on under the hood, using the quote simplified AI is is way easier because you understand what it is that they're simplifying, right? Exactly. Uh, yep. Yeah. Okay, folks, um, I've got time for one more question if you want, and then I'm going to have to depart. Um... Oh, collision checking, uh, Bernardo uh, was saying, using CUDA for parallel collision checking. That's a really interesting application. Yeah. Yep. You could do that too. And and basically uh, particle analysis, particle sim. It's another another common one. Okay. Um, before I depart, does any do folks want to hang out and continue to chat? Or um, if the if you do, let me know and I will transfer the host function of the meeting to that person or to somebody. Um, if folks are uh, kind of had enough for the day and ready to go on with your day, uh, that's also uh, great. I will stop the recording now and see where's the recording. Stop recording. Great talk, by the way, Lloyd. Really enjoyed it.